a little bit. Is there any radiation monitoring going on in Japan for people, for their food supply? I mean, do, do people, I mean, if Japan depends on fish. Fish live in the ocean. The ocean is being filled with radioactive material. Do the Japanese, are they getting irradiated? Do they know that they're getting irradiated to level to which, or is this just a giant uncontrolled experiment and 40 years back and going, oh, look at that spike in birth defects. There is food monitoring going on. Whether it's adequate or not is another question. But, you know, compare the United States to Japan. Japan's legal limit for radioactivity in food is 100 becquerels per kilogram. That's radioactive cesium content, but it's used as a proxy for other radioactive poisons. Right. In the United States, our standard is 12 times weaker. We allow 1,200 becquerels per kilogram of radioactivity in our food. And what that means is unfit for human consumption because of its radioactive contamination in Japan could be legally exported to the United States and sold on the open market. So they are unfortunately way ahead of us here in terms of radiation monitoring of their food supply. Ours is uh, pre-Fukushima at yeah. this point in terms yeah. of the seafood supply. We were we were in a restaurant the other day with a friend who eats fish and, and he just said to the you know, it's not a problem for me. I'm vegan. I, I avoid this stuff. But, you know, he said to the to the waiter, um, where did this fish come from? And the waiter said, just a minute, I'll find out. And he came back and he said it came from China, as far as we can tell. It was imported from Asia. I'm wondering if that came from Japan. Is Japan now a source of discount food because they can sell stuff here that they can't legally sell there? And are we being told if that's the case? It's legal for them to do that, unfortunately, and it's a huge dereliction of duty by the U.S. federal government. Our federal agency should be monitoring the food. Our food safety standards should be much stronger. So we need to change that. We need to change it in Congress. We need to change it in the executive branch through public pressure. Wow. Wow. So 1,200 becquerels in a kilogram of, of, of food coming from Asia, that's 1,200 radioactive disintegrations per hour, per minute? Per second. Per second. Per second. Ongoing. So that's 1,200 opportunities to cause cancer every second that, and that this food would be releasing for, depending on which radioactive isotope it is, months, years, decades, centuries. That's right. A stop. Good day. This is Dr. Conrad Miller, MD, and I'm here today to talk to you about the worst thing happening on the planet right now, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, abbreviated TPP, which involves 800 million people, 40% of the economic activity on the earth, and is the largest free trade deal ever produced in the history of the earth. But you haven't heard about it because it's not on your radio, it's not on your TV, unfortunately. They've had 24 meetings in secret over the last several years, mostly corporations and trade representatives of 12 countries around the Pacific Rim, including the United States, Canada, Peru, Vietnam, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and the door is being left open for China, South Korea, Russia, India, and any other countries that will step in. Okay, the big thing is that corporations, as if they were states, can challenge countries, any law in these countries, for example, federal, state, or local laws in the United States, in secret courts or tribunals where three men, usually it's men, that are the judges, they're all trade lawyers, usually decide in favor of the corporation 90% of the time or more, as in NAFTA or the World Trade Organization, previous free trade agreements, that whatever law is challenged is an illegal barrier to free trade and it has to be changed or eliminated or the country has to pay expected future profits that could have been made because the law was enacted. Of course, nobody wants to pay those. So in these courts, the corporations are empowered to sue for environmental laws, health laws, consumer laws, zoning laws, or any other public policies that the corporations claim are either undermining their rights or diminishing their expected future profits. 
And when these rulings are made in secret, no affected parties can attend the tribunals, including small business owners or workers, local residents, or potentially poisoned people. Just the lawyers for the corporations and those of the challenged country are allowed to attend these tribunals behind closed doors. And the judges one day may be lobbyists for the corporations, and the next day they may be judges. Just three of them. And this is called the Investor State Dispute Settlement. The most horrific thing about these courts or tribunals is that once a decision is made, there can be no appeal to a real court because the TPP tribunals will be the highest court above our Supreme Court if we sign on to this trade agreement. Sign the TPP, we sign away our country's sovereignty and democratic rights as trade agreements supersede national laws. But what we would be doing to ourselves is putting the hammer down for the corporations and banks to tighten their grip on the new world order we keep grimly hearing about. So all of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, they've met in secret, they've developed 29 chapters and only five deal with tariff and trade, and the rest protect the corporations, or as Jim Hightower says, the other 24 chapters consist of various ways to free rapacious corporations from any accountability for the havoc they wreak and from any responsibility to the world community's common good. So that's what can happen in the trade courts. Now specifically there are things that are written up about food safety. For example in the United States we have the highest food standards and we have to harmonize ours down to international standards. Things that also can be challenged are the labeling of genetically modified food. 90% of Americans want their GMOs labeled, their, their soy, their canola, their cottonseed oil. And some states have passed laws that will make it necessary to label genetically modified organisms and crops and food. But these laws can be challenged in these little trade courts or tribunals. Mexico, for example, in 2000, the Senate unanimously backed GMO food labeling. And within three months, the United States threatened to impose sanctions via NAFTA, that was the North American Free Trade Agreement, and the decision was reversed. Then there's also country of origin labeling for meat, and 90% uh, of Americans also favor that, and that can be challenged. Then there's the internet. You can go to the internet, we can look up things very quickly, we can see how a jellyfish swim. how the weather is in Austin, Texas in a few seconds. There was a battle over this and net neutrality that we did win in the United States where the corporations like AT&T and Comcast wanted to make a slow lane for average users and a fast lane for corporate users. But with the TPP, it's already been set up for corporate created uh, content giving copyright protection for that for 120 years and the deal will also transform internet service providers into a private big brother police force empowered to monitor our user activity arbitrarily take down our content and cut off our access to the internet now we also have buy america buy austin buy our own country and we have these deals for government procurement where, for example, the government buys cars or only buys things that aren't made by child labor. And the U.S. procurement market is $1.7 trillion, very big market. Everybody wants to get into it. All the TPP countries want to get into it. And the TPP locks in and expands privatization and de deregulation of public services. And now public services that weren't accessible to corporations will be under the TPP, including transportation, water treatment, corrections, education, health care. Then there's fracking, where the Department of Energy will lose control over how much fracking is done and the environmental impact will not be studied. Uh, it's important because Japan one of the main countries in the TPP is the world's largest natural gas importer, so 
we would expect more fracking to be done in the United States and lose control of how much is done and what environmental damages result. Then we'll lose a lot of jobs. We've already lost about six million jobs because of the various trade agreements that exist. And the U.S. corporations would get special foreign investor protection to limit the cost and risk of relocating their factories to low-wage nations that sign on to this agreement. But Vietnam, for example, the United States Department of Labor has cited Vietnam as one of only three countries in the world to engage in forced child labor in its apparel industry, plus uh, surveys cited unsafe working conditions in its apparel industry. This is important because Vietnam is the second largest exporter of apparel to the United States behind only China. Instead of suspending trade talks with Vietnam until it meets basic international standards for human and workers' rights, we're rewarding them with duty-free access. The TPP would block federal, state, and local governments from taking action to boost job creation, which is kind of outrageous. And then we have the banks. The banks are one of the big authors of most of the, these other 24 chapters in the Trans-Pacific Partnership and they basically don't want any of the rules that normally would protect the government, the people from the banks like transaction taxes, also called Robin Hood taxes, which are already are approved in 11 European countries that that's imposing a tiny tax on Wall Street transactions to tamp down speculation-fueled volatility while generating hundreds of billions of dollars worth of revenue for social health or environmental causes. Then there are firewall reforms that have been blocked by the banks writing them into the TPP. TPP could ban capital controls, which even the International Monetary Fund is in favor of. Basically, extreme deregulation is the problem, and we know that hasn't worked in the United States, and now the TPP is taking that up. So basically, the TPP creates permanent corporate rule over us and all the other countries in the TPP. If we want to make a change in the, in the TPP, we have to get all 12 countries to agree to that change. Otherwise, nothing can be changed. In 2010, all the nations involved signed a formal pledge to keep the details of their deliberations from the public and to keep documents related to the deal undercover until four years after the process is completed. And Ron Kirk, who was Barack Obama's top trade representative, said that locking out the people is necessary because the deal's details would outrage Americans and spook Congress from rubber stamping it. So even though Congress has to regulate commerce with foreign nations. The game is President Obama and the Republicans especially want to, instead of open the whole TPP to Congress and review everything, they want to fast track it, which means everybody can only vote yes or no on the whole deal, one way or the other, and that's the end of it. So the ultimate answer is we've stopped things like this before. We have to say no to fast track, which may come up in the Congress in March. It may take 60 days to pass. If not, we can block the Trans-Pacific Partnership and Fast Track. You can call 202-224-3121 and call your congressman, and we'll leave some other numbers and contacts for you. This is Dr. Conrad Miller. Thank you very much. No to Fast Track. No to the Trans-Pacific Partnership.